So we're going to start with tax law updates. Um, there haven't been a lot of changes, but there were a lot of changes last year, so we're going to make sure that we cover some of those things that caused confusion last year and then any of the changes for this year. So the information that I have is as current as it can be. Um, as I had said earlier, be sure to check your emails, uh, but also our YouTube channel. Uh, if we get additional information or new information, we're going to post videos and send email notifications out to everybody. So we'll get started here with some of the new changes. Uh, the biggest change in terms of tax code is going to be this. It's the, uh, the penalty for not having health insurance no longer applies for 2019 federal tax returns. Now, while the shared responsibility payment or the individual mandate or the penalty, whichever you want to call it, was not repealed, it was reduced into, uh, to the penalty amount of zero dollars, effectively eliminating it. Now, there are some states, uh, three, that do have state-level individual mandates, and those are Massachusetts, New Jersey, and the District of Columbia. Vermont did pass legislation, but that does not take effect until tax year 2020. Now, this only applies to those customers or those taxpayers who did not have health insurance. If they bought health insurance through the marketplace, they still have to reconcile the IRS for the premium tax credit using Form 8962. Okay, uh, so that piece hasn't changed. Um, it just has reduced the amount of questions that we have to ask. Now it's a singular question, which is, did you buy health insurance through the marketplace? The IRS has created a new form for seniors. It is uh, Form 1040-SR. Um, the only two requirements for this form are that they are age 65 or older um, and that they file with, uh, that they claim the standard deduction versus itemizing. There are no income limits or restrictions on types of income reported. Um, similar, the, the form is similar to a 1040 EZ. I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys that form now. This is what the 1040 SR looks like. I want you guys to kind of get a visual um, so that if you see it in the software, you know what it is and what you're looking at and why it was there. So as you can see, it doesn't look very much different than a standard 1040. Um, to be completely honest, everything, it's, a, it's the same 12 pages, or two pages rather. Um, everything is kind of the same. It doesn't look much different. The supplemental schedules that were added last year following Tax Cuts and Jobs Act were, there were six new supplemental schedules in tax year 2018. Um, this year, the IRS has redesigned and merged those into three schedules. Um, hopefully this will streamline the process, but as well as save us, uh, you know, save you some paper um, and having to print schedules. I'm going to show you guys what those schedules are going to look like here. Schedule 1 is not much different than it was last year. This is the additional income and adjustments to income. Um, and as you scroll down, you can see, I mean, it's part 1 and part 2 are basically the same as it was. The big changes are on schedules 3 and 4, or 2 and 3 rather. Uh, schedule 2 is now referred to as additional taxes. This is where you have tax um, as well as other taxes. So part one is all AMT and advanced premium tax credit. And then part two is going to be self-employment tax, uh, repayment of the first time home buyer credit, things of that nature. When we get down into schedule three, this is additional credits and payments. Now the additional credits and payments, um, you'll have your non-refundable credits, um, and like child, uh, child care and dependent care expenses, as well as the non-refundable parts of education credits. Uh, down in the other payments section is where estimated tax payments are reported uh, uh, under, uh, under receiving the premium tax credit. So if the IRS owes them more on the premium tax credit would show up here, as well as any amount that they paid for, uh, that they paid with their extension to file. Those would all go to schedule three. These are the tax brackets. So the tax rates have not changed this year. They did make that change last year. Um, the tax brackets themselves are not much different than they were last year. They, they do adjust them for inflation every year, but it's not a huge change. Same thing with the capital gains rates. It's still 0, 15, and 20%, and then an adjustment for the brackets. 
so now we're going to move into the 2019 Earned Income Tax Credit parameters. So this chart here is for filing status of single and head of household. So the number of dependents is here listed across the top. So you see the income at to receive the max credit um, is fourteen thousand five seventy for three dependents. The maximum credit anyone is going to receive this year for EIC is six thousand five hundred fifty seven dollars. Doesn't matter if they're single, head of household, or married filing jointly. One of the important lines here is the phase out ends. At this AGI, taxpayers filing single or head or household, zero, zero, one, two, three dependents, are not going to qualify for any amount of earned income credit. This will save you some time as you're going through returns and trying to determine why earned income credit isn't popping up. If you know that their single or head of household and their AGI is over 50,000, there's a high likelihood that they're not going to qualify for earned income credit in that scenario. Married filing joint, uh, the income at max credit is the same, the max credit is the same, uh, the phase out is what goes up. Um, so for three plus defendants, it's 55,000, almost 56,000. So again, if they're over 56,000, you can know that they're not going to qualify for earned income credit. Child tax credit, now while this wasn't a change this year, um, there were some clarifications that happened this year. So the primary clarification is um, 2000 is the amount that we hear publicly about the child tax credit. The truth of it is, is it's actually two credits. There's a non-refundable piece, which is $600, and then there's a refundable piece that is $1,400. So by and large part, your clients that were receiving 1000 um, in child tax credit in their refund in prior years, that amount went up to 1400 not the full 2000 that's being reported, okay? The other clarification that we got is in order to claim any portion of the child tax credit, the taxpayer must include a social security number for each qualifying child. Now, the taxpayer can have an ITIN, but the qualifying child must have a social security number. Credit for other dependents, uh, ODC or family tax credit, those are all the same things. It is a $500 non-refundable tax credit. And in order to claim the credit, the qualifying dependent must be a U.S. citizen, a U.S. national, or U.S. resident alien. No more claiming dependents that live in Canada and Mexico. Uh, for this credit, you would not qualify for the other dependent credit in that circumstance. Standard deduction amounts. Standard deduction amount for 2019 uh, is about $200 more a person for single married filing, separate married filing joint, and went up $350 per person for head of household. As a reminder, personal exemption, oh, excuse me, personal exemptions have been suspended and will be until tax year 2026. So we'll talk about some of the contribution limits um, in the next couple of slides. So IRA contribution limits have increased to $6,000 with a $1,000 catch-up amount for taxpayers over 50. HSA contributions, um, have the, the limits have increased to $3,500 for self and $7,000 for family. 401k contribution limits have been increased to $19,000 uh, and then a $6,000 for taxpayers over 50 in catch-up contributions. The elimination of em entertainment expenses. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act eliminated uh, being able to take a deduction for the expenses um, on a Schedule C, on a Schedule E, Schedule F, uh, 1065, 1120, 1120S, any of the corporate forms um, are also included in this for golf outings, fishing trips, tickets to professional sporting events, and theater tickets. Those are no longer acceptable expenses. Alimony payments. For divorce decrees signed after 12-31-2018 that have alimony payments, the payer will not be allowed a deduction for the payments made, nor will the payee be required to claim the alimony as income on their respective tax returns. This is important because it changed. Prior to that, both of those were true. They would have to, uh, the payer could claim a deduction and the payee would have to report it as income. So it's important to know when the divorce decree was signed if it has alimony payments. Changes to the Schedule A. So the medical expense limit 
uh, has gone up to 10% of the AGI. Uh, last year it was at 7.5%. Mortgage interest, all of this is the same as last year, but we did get quite a few questions about home equity loans. You cannot claim a mortgage interest uh, deduction for uh, home equity loans or any equity loans at all. State and local tax deductions and limits, so the SALT tax. There was a bit of confusion here. Now, taxpayers may claim an itemized deduction up to $10,000 on their Schedule A. If the taxes and property, local taxes, property taxes were paid while conducting a trade or business such as a rental property, it is not capped at $10,000, but it would not be reported to a Schedule A. That would go to whatever, whether it's a Schedule F or a Schedule E, uh, in the example of a rental property. Charitable contributions, the AGI ceiling limitation has been increased to 60%. There is one caveat to that, and that is that charitable deductions for contributions in exchange for college athletic event seating is no longer allowed. Okay. Casualty losses, this was a big question um, in particular for our Houston preparers over the last couple of years. Casualty losses are still allowed, but only for losses declared a disaster by the president. So no more theft, no more fire, no more storm, shipwreck, or other casualty losses. You can only claim the casualty loss if the loss is in a declared disaster by the president. This one caused a bit, of, uh, quite a bit of confusion. So Tax Cuts and Jobs Act eliminated the abilities for employees to deduct unreimbursed work-related expenses on their Schedule A. This basically eliminates the Form 2106 for most taxpayers. I would encourage you to look at Form 2106 and determine whether or not your taxpayer fits into those very few exceptions. Okay. Also, uh, there is no overall limitation on the itemized deduction, so there's no phase out for itemized deductions. There's no cap. AMT changes. Um, AMT, the, the exemptions went up about $1,400 a person. The phase-outs went up about $10,300 a person. Moving expenses remain suspended with the exception of military. Now, the military has two requirements. One is they must be active duty military. And two, they must have a transfer or move order from the military. Qualified business expenses, so QBI, uh, RET, PTP, all of these things were in the same group last year. There's a new form for uh, calculating the QBI. Form 8995 for simplified and Form 8995A for more complex. I'm going to show you guys both those forms. This is the 8995. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I, I don't think there's going to be a lot of manual entry um, on this form. I, I think the software will calculate most of these fields based on the information you provided other places in the return. And this is the 8995A, so you see that there is quite a bit of difference uh, as far as that goes. So now we're going to move into what's new in the software. Now, we've been working on another project um, and still in fully implementing all of the tax changes for Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So there haven't been any major changes, but the big change is the refund calculator. So the refund calculator is something that you guys have been asking for for years. This will allow you to create an estimate without actually having to create a return. So I'm going to walk you through a real quick estimate. We're going to do a single person with dependents. We're going to file head of household. We're going to put in the date of birth. We're going to say they have three children for under the age of 17 with SSNs, three under the age of 18 for earned income credit. Then it moves into income. Now we're going to do a pretty simple one, but if you click, it expands out, and you're not asking for anything specific, just general numbers. So we're going to do 27,100, and we'll do 
And this is where you could put in your deductions or your adjustments rather. We're going to skip that. I think by and large part you guys will probably skip that majority of the time. Credits. Uh, let's say we pay 2500 for three. So here's the results. This is the tax summary. Now again, this is an estimate. It's not an exact science. But the refund for this person should be around $10,000. That's a great refund. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, if you click fee summary, this is where you can enter in your tax prep fee. And so if you go back, you'll see here what the total fees are and what they can expect if they do the bank product. This is what they can expect if they just paid you cash up front. If you want to create a new return from it, you can just click create return. It'll launch a new return and take you right to the client data sheet. And the small amount of information that's been entered into here will carry over. So that's been the biggest change um, in the software. The other changes in the TaxPass mobile app retrieval We've enabled the function for your TaxPass mobile app customers to actually be able to submit documents after they've submitted the return. So if they submit the return, then you tell them, hey, uh, I need you to submit a W-2, or they tell you, oh, I got another W-2. They can open the app back up, scan, and then submit the documents. And when you come to this screen, you just select the return and click Download Documents and those will go directly into the document archive inside the return. Okay, so not a lot of changes in the software, not a lot of changes in tax law, pretty quick uh, group of things here. So we're gonna move right on into this social media presentation. So growing your business using social media Billions, yes, literally billions of people visit social media websites and applications every single day. Uh, social media is one of the most powerful and least expensive ways to grow your business. It allows you to attract new customers and connect with an audience that you never would have otherwise. You can get your brand in front of a vast audience. And I'm going to add to this, you can get your brand in front of a vast audience or relatively small amounts of money. Most of you can reach within 30 to 40,000 people within, a, within five miles of your business for 25 or $30. Uh, that's the most effective, uh, cost-effective method of, of branding or marketing uh, available. And you can establish yourself as a thought leader in your industry. So let's be clear. While the service that, that you guys provide is tax preparation, what you're actually selling is your knowledge. These customers can go to TurboTax and they can do this themselves. Um, they can fill it out at home, you know, mail it in if they want to do it that way. There are options for, the, for them to do self-prepared returns. They come to you as tax preparers because you're a thought leader in the industry. You're an expert you know more than they do and they're much more comfortable letting an expert do it than doing it themselves. So this raises important questions um, in terms of social media. What's the best platform to use? What tactics should you use to be seen by the most people? Are there certain types of content that perform better than others? How can you regularly post content? What are the etiquette rules? And we're going to cover all of these in this, in this presentation. In order to build your business through social media, you need to have a strategy in place. You cannot just wing it. Without a plan, uh, a definitive plan for how you're going to use social media, you probably, and I'm going to adjust that, you certainly won't get the results that you want. So in this workshop, you'll discover an effective step-by-step -step social media strategy for building your business. If you implement and do the things that we talk about, you should see growth in your social media presence. So step one is choose your platforms. In order to do this, you need to know your audience. Where do they spend most of their time um, on social media? Where do they like to interact with brands and businesses? What sites influence them to purchase? Who are the biggest influencers in your space and what platforms do they use? I will give you guys a tip. Um, Facebook is the preferred and probably best platform for a tax preparer. Um, 
it allows you to, to market yourself as an industry expert um, and it, it's set up for question and answering. We're going to talk about that in a second. So you want to be where your audience is. Um, if you're posting tax tips in Pinterest, it's probably not going to get you a result that you want. So if you publish primarily on platforms where they don't spend their time, they'll never engage with what you post. And you want them to engage with what you post because when they engage, it engages other people as well. So if you don't know where your audience spends most of their social media time, all you have to do is ask them. They come in and see you guys. Ask them, hey, do you have a Facebook page? You know, do you use Facebook? You should go follow our page. Or, you know, what do you use? you like YouTube better? Just ask questions. You, you, we're all in the business of asking questions on a regular basis. And as they're sitting there, you have time to ask the kinds of questions that can help you grow your business. So if you already have social media platforms, but even if you don't, you can go look at some of the industry experts. Um, you can go look at HR Block and go look at Jackson Hewitt. You can go look at other tax preparers and see which of their posts are getting the biggest response. So one of the things that, that you want to do when you're doing this is investigate a little what other people are posting, what they're doing, because it's if it's working for them, it should work for you. So one of the one other thing to consider when choosing your social media platform is what are you selling? And we talked about this just earlier. You're not selling tax preparation services. You're selling tax knowledge. You're selling yourself. You're selling faith. You're selling trustworthiness. You're selling honesty, and you're selling knowledge. As you consider what platforms to use, it's essential that you think smaller rather than big. You don't have to be on every platform to be successful. And in fact, the more platforms you are, uh, that you are on, it increases the likelihood that you won't be successful. Of course, you can always fall back on Facebook. Facebook is the go-to. So at the end of the day, what matters most is not the particular platform you choose, but rather that you choose one and you stick with it. It is incredibly important that you stay consistent with posting, that you post in a consistent manner. You don't want to go years without posting. And in fact, having a Facebook page, for example, that hasn't posted since 2012 sends a message to any potential customers that you're not invested in your business and they can't trust you. Step two is optimize your social media profile. Select a professional username and you want to be consistent when you're doing this as well. But you don't want to put doglover47 for your tax business when you set up your page. Okay, so for Facebook, set up a professional page and not a personal profile. Those are two drastically different things. Personal profile is for you as an individual, as a person. The page is for your business. And those two things are separate and should remain so. The other side is if you don't set up a prof professional page, you don't get to take the full advantage of everything Facebook offers for businesses. Try to keep your username the same across all networks. If you watch and, and follow us on social media, for example, our Facebook page is Simple Tax Services. Our Twitter is at Simple Tax Serve. Our uh, Instagram is Simple Tax. Our YouTube channel is Simple Tax Support. So you stay consistent so that your clients and prospective clients can find you on other platforms or on the platforms that they are on. Use a high quality profile photo. There's two schools of thought on this. Um, one is use a photo of yourself. The other is use your logo. Either one is perfectly acceptable, but you want to use a high quality professional photo um, or a high quality professional logo. You don't want to do, I, I mean, I've seen some businesses do this. They have their business card done and then they take a picture of their business card for their Facebook profile. That's not a good idea. Use the best graphics. If you don't have a logo, there's some places I'm going to tell you about. So the photo is one of the first things that people see when they click on your social media profile. So that's your first impression. If you need to have a logo design, you can go to places like Fiverr or Upwork. Those are great places to start. You can also reach out to our company, First Solution. We do uh, logo design as well. 
write a compelling about section. What is it that you do that sets yourself apart from everyone else? Why would they want to come to you versus going to h and Block versus going to Jackson Hewitt? That's the information that you want to put in your about section. You want to include links to your website, your other social media profiles, and any other relevant links. I'm going to give you a tip here as well for those of you that are in this, this webinar. On your Facebook page, put the link to Where's My Refund. And when a customer calls you and says, hey, how, where do I check the status of my refund? Send them to your Facebook page. Go, hey, go check out our Facebook page. Like us while you're there. And on, in the About section there, there's a link where you can click and get right to the IRS uh, where's my refund? Send them back through your social media versus sending them directly to the IRS if you can. Upload a professional cover photo. So if your business has a slogan or a motto, consider the putting that slogan on your cover photo. Now the cover photo is the big rectangle image at the top of the page. The profile photo is what we were talking about earlier. That's the smaller square box. On social media sites such as Facebook, you can upload a cover video instead of a photo. Video always do, does better than photos. If you can do a video, do a video as opposed to putting a photo. Answer all your contact information. You want to make it as easy as possible for potential customers to contact you. You don't want them having to search to try to find you. Be professional when you're dealing in the online environment. Determine how, how you want to represent yourself and your business online. If a customer writes a complaint or a nasty review or something like that on your page, I'm going to offer you the best, ways, the best way to handle that. The first thing you don't want to do is delete it. Leave it. The second thing you don't want to do is respond to it in the post uh, as far as that goes. You, what, what you want to do is take them offline. If uh, you watch any of the, if you watch the channels or the pages for any of the airline companies, cell phone companies, they're ridiculously good about this and that's if a customer complains, they almost have a canned response that says, I'm sorry that you're having that problem. Can you send me your information? Can you DM me your information so that I can follow up with you? The reason that you want to do that is you want to get them offline. You don't want to engage them online. You don't want to have a back and forth and have an argument with a customer online or a discussion with a customer online. The same thing applies if they're in your office and they're causing a scene. The best thing that you can do is get them to a place where you can be one-on-one. -on -one. People in a one-on-one -on -one scenario are much more relaxed. They're much less angry. Um, they're much less aggressive in a one-on-one -on -one environment. When they don't have an audience, people are much more reasonable. Okay. Once you resolve that problem with them, ask them to go back and comment on their original post so that other people who see that go, yes, there was a problem, but they took care of it, they handled it. And if you, and if you handle the problem well enough, ask them for a review as well. That, that has a huge impact on prospective customers. No one expects you to be perfect, but they want to know what you're going to do when a mistake happens, how you're going to handle it, how you're going to treat them if something doesn't work, doesn't go 100% correct. Okay? Create a posting schedule. So create a social media calendar. And this calendar will allow you to plot out when you're going to post, what you're going to post, and, and in a lot of cases you'll be able to uh, you, you can use Facebook tools to actually schedule those posts well in advance. When you're creating a social media calendar, ask yourself the following questions. How often will you post? Let me give you guys some advice here for tax preparers because I've been doing this for some time. From the months of December through April, you should be posting every other day or every third day. After April, your customers don't want to hear from you as much. You should be posting one to three times a month. That's the schedule that you want to follow. What formats will you use? And by formats, I mean medium. Uh, are you going to use pictures? Are you going to use text? Are you going to use cartoons? Are you going to use graphics? Are you going to use video? 
And then what sort of content will you post? Are you going to post tax tips? You're going to post behind the scenes photos? You're going to post, uh, you know, you're going to do a live session where you do a Q&A with customers answering tax questions? This is what we mean by content. You may be thinking, why do I have to map all this out in advance? Why can't I just start posting? You can, but using a social media calendar helps you be consistent with posting. And as I said earlier, being consistent is the key to being successful with social media. By creating that social media calendar, you do the hard work of figuring out what you're going to post up front. Um, if any of you are like me, if it's not on my calendar, it doesn't get done and it gets forgotten. And then I'm scrambling to try to figure out what to do. Second, using that calendar forces you to be active on social media. Because it's on your calendar, you're going to go do it. Begin posting on social media. It's important to constantly post things that will add value to your audience. Now, I want to clarify this a little bit. It's not important that you constantly post. You don't have to post every day. You don't have to post every single day. But whatever it is that you're posting needs to add value to your audience, to your customer base. Your post should help your audience to think about something in a new way, take action like they never have, laugh or smile or learn something valuable. I will tell you for tax preparers, Learn something valuable is right at the top of that list. If you know your audience well, you will know what they find most valuable. And I'll give you an example. If you have a high EIC, low AGI group of customers, posting that IRA contribution is probably not something that they will find valuable, right? But posting about the new AGI, uh, or the new EIC credit amounts might be. Education credits might be. So it's understanding your audience. Consider posting things like inspirational quotes, tips and tactics, tutorial videos, live videos, pictures that will motivate your audience. Let's be clear on this. No matter which one of these you choose, you don't want your entire page to be inspirational quotes. You're tax preparers. You're not life coaches. You don't want it all to be tips and tactics. There needs to be a good mix and a balance of everything. For example, let's say that you're a tax preparer. When creating your content calendar and posting on social media, ask yourself, is this adding value to my audience? Will my customers learn something new? Will they take an action? Experiment with different formats. Um, try videos. Try going live. Try posting pictures. Try different formats to see what your audience responds to the best. I can tell you historically or statistically, Video does way better than pictures, and pictures do way better than just plain text posts. You may be thinking, I don't have time to constantly be posting. And that's fine. You don't have to. And that's why I said, with, with the platform of Facebook in particular, you can use a function called scheduled posts. So you can take an hour, two hours out of your day, and you post a year's worth of information. Engage with your followers. Conversations are the key to getting more clients through social media. Social media is not a one-way street. If somebody comments, you want to reply. One of the things that matters most when it comes to social media is that you feel authentic. Authentic, in particular for tax preparers, says I am honest. And honesty is one of the key virtues of a tax preparer. Authenticity is attractive. It will attract audience, it will attract new business. Social media platforms tend to prioritize the posts with the most engagement. So your objective should be getting your customers or your followers to engage with your post. And what they mean by engage, what that term means in social media land is like, share, comment. Those are engagements. Clicking on a link is also considered an engagement. So you must talk with your followers, create conversation, uh, create conversations, answer questions, and then respond to any problems that are raised. Your goal is to create a real relationship with your audience. How can you create conversations with your followers? Ask questions. Do live videos in which you talk to your audience. Conduct polls. Polls are the number one thing that I think gets overlooked on social media, in particular on Facebook. Ask others to comment on a particular topic. For example, if you have, if you want to post uh, something about home mortgage interest, 
and you've got a friend who's a mortgage broker, ask them to comment. You guys can start connecting with each other's audiences that way. Make statements that will get people talking. Focus on being real and authentic. Follow the right people. Follow influencers in your industry. I know we all view them as competitors, but it's okay to follow H&R Block on Facebook. No one will know. Follow H&R Block, follow Jackson Hewitt, follow the banking partners, follow Simple Tax. Take our information, share it. It's okay to do that. Join groups that are related to your industry. Take note of the value, valuable information that others are sharing because you can, you can share that information as well. Additionally, what sort of content seems to be getting the best response? So as you're in these groups or you're following you know, H&R Block, and yes, they have brand recognition, but you can still see a pattern of what is what are people engaging with most? What, what posts are getting the most like? What is that content about? Take advantage of platforms that focus heavily on answering questions that are posed by users. Facebook is key for this. Use hashtags. Now I'm going to age myself a little bit. That is a pound sign. It will be a pound sign until I die. Hashtags are words with the pound symbol before them. Some examples of hashtags, hashtag Monday Motivation, hashtag Tax Day, hashtag Tax Pro, hashtag Where's My Refund. Hashtags are used as a way of grouping posts by subject. This allows people to click the hashtag and get other posts that have that hashtag so that they can get additional information or see more content. Some sites such as Twitter uh, highlight the most popular hashtags, giving you a sense of what's trending at any given time. The power of hashtags is that they allow you to get your audience, or get your content rather, in front of a broader audience. When someone clicks that hashtag link, they don't have, oh, they don't have to be following your page to see your content. So how do you use hashtags? So here's a great example of a post that you can do um, and utilize hashtags effectively. First thing that we notice in this is the hashtags are at the bottom. You want the hashtags at the end, you don't want them at the beginning. So this post, for example, you can say, before you file your taxes, spend at least 10 minutes getting your income documents and receipts organized. Hashtag tax day, hashtag tax pro, hashtag tax refund. Now, as you become more experienced with hashtags, you'll start to learn how to integrate those actually into your post. Like this one, for example, we could have said, before you file your hashtag tax return, spend at least 10 minutes getting all of your income documents and receipts organized. Including your hashtag in that message is a great way to do it because your customer doesn't have to stop reading to read the hashtag or specifically read the hashtag. Beware though, if your hashtags aren't really related to the content of your post, you could turn people away. This is my number one pet peeve with social media is we would have a post like this one before you file your taxes post, and then these hashtags at the bottom would be hashtag Houston Texans, hashtag Monday Night Football, hashtag impeachment. Those things have nothing to do with the content that you're doing. And for me as a social media consumer um, or a social media user, I will unfollow that person for that because now you're just telling me that your objective is to get the most likes or the most comments on this and it's not, your objective isn't sharing actual valid information. So get help with hashtags. These are some, uh, some companies or some websites that you can use to learn more about hashtags and even get some help picking the right hashtags. Um, all hashtag, seek metrics, tailwind, and ingrammar are four tools that I utilize on a regular basis. Experiment. Experiment with different types of content um, try different, different kinds of content will resonate with your audience differently. Um, so try different things. It's okay. Um, it's especially critical since social media platforms are constantly changing. For example, when Facebook started going live, they actually didn't announce or uh, didn't really run a public announcement that they had implemented Facebook Live. Um, and the commercials didn't even really start until almost 18 months after they had already been live. So pay attention, look around on your social media platforms, you might find things you didn't know. For example, I don't know how many of you guys knew this, um, but you can actually share your screen on Facebook in a Facebook Live event. 
be constantly testing to see what works, what works most effectively. So watch the content that you post, watch the mediums that you use, and post more of what people are engaging with and less of what they're not engaging with. So are you using social media? Begin. The advantages of social media are enormous. It's not particularly complicated to get started building your business through social media. You just have to be willing to do it. You don't need to be intimidated by social media. This is the number one reason that people, that businesses don't use social media is because they are intimidated by it. Keep this in mind. Social media is something you will never know if you never use it. You have to get in. You have to use it. And 13-year-olds can use social media. We're smarter than them. We ought to be able to do this. Just don't wait any longer. There are clients out there waiting for you to find them. And for tax preparers in particular, every person over the age of 18 that you come in contact with is a potential client. And social media is the best way for you to come in contact with the most people at any given moment. Facebook literally has 2 billion users. YouTube is right behind them. 